right, hi everyone. Welcome to another virtual counterculture. Uh, we're here with Point Reyes today. Um, one quick note, I'm Mallory, I'm new um, to panelists, the panelists with um, counterculture. Um, I'm the creative director here at Culture. So um, nice to see everybody. Um, if you, one quick note, if you have any questions, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, so you can just type in there. Um, we'll try to get to the questions throughout, but if not, there's a dedicated time at the end that we'll be answering questions. So without further ado, take it away, Point Reyes. Hi, Mallory. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we're really excited to be here. Um, I'm Lynn Giacomini, I'm one of the owners of Point Reyes Farmstead, and... Um, I'm Bob and Merlin, and I'm head cheesemaker. Head cheesemaker extraordinaire. We have a lot we want to share with you today. So I want to talk you through what we're going to experience. Um, of course, you guys have your box of cheese that we're going to be doing some tasting and doing a little bit of a deep dive with you guys on how we make these cheeses so that you're real familiar with them. Um, we also want to talk about our sustainability practices on the farm. What makes us unique, what you want to talk to your customers about, in particular, Farmstead and what we're doing here and what we've been doing in the last couple of years to grow the company and um, in particular with uh, the ladies behind us here and what they're up to. Uh, and I also want to introduce you to our um, sales directors that you may know, or if you don't, they will be reaching out to you, but they are awesome. They're extraordinaires in their own fields, and I want to just introduce you to them, and they can speak a little bit about themselves and their background. So first, we'll start with East Coast. Um, Leif Durbin is our East Coast Sales Director. Hi, Leif. Hi, guys. Nice to see you. Uh, I'm Leif. I'm the East Coast Sales Director for Point Reyes. Uh, I've been in the specialty food industry about 13 years uh, and working for Lynn and the Giacomini's since February of 2019. Uh, focusing on customers east of Colorado um, from my home fortress in Queens, New York. Uh, so I hope you guys all enjoy. I'll be answering some questions on the chat and uh, following up with you after the event. Great, thanks. And then we have Connie Conkon um, in the West Coast. She resides in Portland, Oregon. Connie? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so just to start off, Connie Concon is my married name. Everybody asks me if it's really my name. Lynn was not stuttering. That is my name. But um, yeah, I live in Portland, Oregon. I have hit the lottery to work for such a great company, Point Reyes. Um, it's been a year and I've been fortunate. I've been in the business a little bit longer than Leaf. I don't want to give my age away. But um, started, I launched a domestic blue cheese years ago and then transitioned to import cheese. And now I'm with the most amazing California cheese in the world. So um, I'm here in Portland, enjoy this. Every time I watch it, it just melts my heart and I hope you guys will enjoy as much as I do. Thanks. Great. Um, thanks you guys. And um, once again, they're here to help with any type of merchandising, marketing, sales support all those good things to make your life easier. But first we want to bring the farm to you. Obviously it's, it's been difficult for all of us during COVID and um, it's definitely honed our marketing skills and our video skills. So Annie is our producer in the background and she's going to start to show you um, our video of the farm. So for those of you who have not been to the farm, here we go. So we are located. <laughs> We are located um, about an hour north of San Francisco out in West Marin. You're looking at the head of Tamales Bay up there that goes out to the ocean, the mouth of the ocean. Across the way is the town of Inverness. We are a family business, as you can see. I'm third generational dairy family. We primarily have Holsteins. We're gonna talk about those in a little bit. But Farmstead, meaning that you know we do have an operating dairy. We milk about 400. Um, Holsteins today and our milk goes into um, our cheese. We're going to talk about this in a little bit, but this is our robotic milking machine, one of our new innovations. Um, 
as well as this is um, our methane digester. So we'll talk a little bit about our renewable energy and sustainability practices on the farm, which are part of our core values. Of course, um, the milking parlor is only about 50 yards from our creamery, so the milk goes straight into the vats. And you'll be seeing more pictures, and we'll be talking more specifically, or Kuba will be, about how we make our cheeses. So uh, this is our Toma cheese, which we're really excited that, that this is going to be focused on, and really, um, you're going to get specifics on our Toma here. You'll see more of this. We're kind of getting some of these videos are the same, but that's okay. The more you see it, the more excited you will be. Some spoiler alert. It's a little spoiler alert. It's like a trailer. <laughs> uh yes and um for all of those of you who got the packages you're seeing how we cut our toma here and that's what you have in your package today this is a picture of our culinary center which is called the fork at point rays we do a lot of educational deep dives we drink a lot of wine obviously there too but it's a really a community um it's our table where we want to share our cheese our um, education and entertainment is part of our philosophy so there's the fork and when COVID is over we invite all of you to come out and spend some time with us here on the farm and get to know the people behind the products we're also celebrating of course 20 years in cheese so um i guess you know i want to start with that real quick 20 years we've been making um well, our original blue for 20 years. That's what we started with. Um, but we've really been in the farmstead business and producing a product off the farm, and that's our fluid milk for 61 years. So my parents purchased um, our farm in, uh, in 1959. And then um, we didn't start using our milk into the vat until 2000. But um, along the way, we've added all these other cheeses, and we're really excited that Kuba came into um, on our team in 2009. Why don't you talk briefly about your, your background and where you came from? So I'm originally from Poland. I studied food science uh, in University of uh, Poznań, and right after college, I decided that I need to figure something in my life, and I um, applied for the uh, student exchange program through Ohio State University um, to come to the United States and work in a food science program. So then I was assigned into a small creamery um, in Indianapolis, where I stayed for a couple of years in a very small plant. Uh, I, was, I kind of call it an R&D plant because they only process about uh, 1,000 gallons of milk a week, which is very little compared to what we do right now here in Point Reyes. We, in Point Reyes, we process 5,000 gallons of milk every day. So uh, significant different size, but it was a good learning curve for me. I worked with uh, the Dutch cheese maker who's, you know, um, somewhat, you know, it's uh, thanks to him, a Toma, it's Dutch style cheese. So, you know, the, a little bit of uh, his training obviously rubbed off on me and then uh, that's how we came up with Toma. But um, yeah, so it's uh, the, the Indianapolis the thing was good. and. Um, for the couple of years, but I was ambitious to keep climbing the ladder. So I took a job in Minnesota for a year. I didn't like, didn't like it. It was super cold and freezing. And I came for an interview in 2008 on November, which Minnesota was freezing already. And I came here and it was like 72 degrees, it was sunny. So I knew that that's, that's the spot. So within three months, I was, I was up here, started making cheese with, you know, not much experience in blue cheese making. I actually didn't know anything about blue cheese, uh, how to make it or not. So, um, so that was somewhat challenging at first. Um, there were some tweaks we had to do uh, to the recipe, um, but you know, overall, after eight months of hard work, mm -hmm. we we figured out um, where the problems were, and then we also at the same time started working on new products um, just because. Lynn and Joe mm -hmm. and, and Diana, they really wanted to extend their product line and have some other products. So Toma actually really was the first chief which we launched uh, after Original Blue. So, mm -hmm. um, and you know, since, since then we, at first we were just the purest only making um, plain Toma and we were perfecting that recipe. And up until like last couple of years, we decided that it's time to expand and uh, play with flavors. And that's where we got the three additional flavors right now. 
Yeah. So let's talk about that and start tasting because I'm sure you guys are eager to start tasting uh, the cheeses here. Um, in your box, you should have received um, five cheeses and most of you know original blue, but we wanted to add a bay blue into the box to finish with that today. But we're going to start with our Tomas and talk about what's really inspired us to make this line. Um, as Kuba said, you know, for the first nine years, all we made was original blue. And we quickly realized that not everybody likes blue cheese and that's a little bit too potent for some of them. So we wanted to make an everyday cheese that really satisfied all palates, all ages, and um, was super versatile. One of the things about blue cheese in general is people know what to do with blue cheese when you say blue cheese. And so when we wanted to make a table cheese, a farmer's cheese, um, we selected the name Toma because um, Italian, my main name is Giacomini, and we wanted to reach back into the Italian um, traditions and how, you know, they have a wheel of cheese on the table from morning till night. They cook with it, they eat with it. It's part of their everyday diet. And we're trying to, as American cheesemakers, really transition our American palates and eating habits into realizing that cheese is this great protein. It tastes fantastic if you've got great quality cheese. A milk, um, but that it can be a part of your, you know, morning, noon, and night um, snacking meals and so forth, and just eating healthy. So um, when we asked Kuba to make another cheese, he he came up with you did an Alpine style Gouda and um, and Toma. So Toma in Italian means. Um, it's really describing the format. So it's the wheel that it's describing, that it's a round wheel of cheese. But it was also defined as a farmer using his or her own milk, highlighting those flavors coming from those milk components. And um, it was really what, what Farmstead means is that we use our own source of milk and that we um, were really watching for those milk components to bring in the flavors of that milk and that it's got some nice complexities mm -hmm. to it. Yes. Um, we do actually, we use our milk in, um, on the farm, 100% goes into original blue. That's probably our most consistently farmstead to where we're not purchasing milk from an outside source. All of it goes into original blue and then any new products that we're developing. But two years ago in 2018, we did purchase um, a new creamery, a second creamery in Sonoma County in Petaluma, and that's our pasteurized plant. So we sometimes use our milk from the farm and sometimes we buy it from other local farmers that match our milk components so that we're still talking about North Bay milk, and, which is the key. And just for all of you guys who don't know, how far Petaluma is, it's only, it's only 40 minutes away. So- Half hour, my journey. Yeah, so, um, 40 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> so we still, like I said, we still um, very much um, working hard to always use local milk. And there is a reason behind why we do that. It's yeah. because the climate we have, the cows grazing on the pastures and living in, uh, makes it where the milk component stays constant and they don't fluctuate like in the East Coast due to severe weather is like high heat or super cold. Uh, and that makes that makes our product too very consistent throughout the year. Like you, sometimes you guys hear about seasonality in milk and seasonality in cheese. For us, it's kind of non-existent because the, the fluctuations between uh, the milk components are so insignificant that they really don't make that big of an effect on uh, on the cheese. So. Well, let's start eating Toma because I know everybody's getting hungry and probably has the cheese in front of them. And then we'll go back and talk more about the animals and um, our practices here on the farm. So Toma, everybody have a piece of the Toma? And I always like to pick it up and smell it. Um, and it gives you a sense of what you're gonna be tasting in your mouth. So- You get that sweetness. Mm -hmm. Up front you can smell that um, sweet cooked milk. Yep. Like a cooked, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a brown butter, yeah. and you're gonna taste that as well. I get yeasty sourdough notes. Um, this is definitely a real flavorful, flavorful everyday um, cheese. Annie, you want to start the Toma video, and Kuba can talk about how we actually make this. So the video will start probably with cutting the curds already, which you know the, the cheese, the milk was inoculated um, with cultures and rennet, and after it's set. Um, the video starts right now. It's uh, the cutting process is all 
it's somewhat automated um, in the sense of that the, um, the machine is doing cutting. However, the cheesemaker's involvement is still pretty high because you see he manually pre-cuts the curd to get to the right size. This is actually a very finished curd, which was uh, drained into a uh, pre-pressed table. And um, right now what the cheesemakers are doing is they're cutting out the square slabs of curd, which will be placed into the forms. And from the forms, they will be moving into um, the, uh, the press. And you can see that the pre-pressing process only takes um, 15 minutes, but you can see how that loose curd is actually binds together. And it's almost, it's almost like the curd itself has a glue and the curds like really stick to each other. Even like, even if you let this curd sit for five minutes, it will all already bind up. So this is, this is a pressing process. We have a vertical presses, which um, apply a certain amount of pressure on the wheels uh, to um, remove excess moisture, control the texture of the cheese, as well as making sure that the, the texture when you cut the wheel uh, has a nice even pace. There should be some ice in it, but not cracks. Um, and then the following step is what any showing right now is a brining. So we have a deep brining system and uh, Thomas, um, when they go into brining, they sit there for 48 hours to achieve the right salt content. Um, after that, we do some treatment on the surface of the cheese. So to prevent from excessive malt growth and preserving that beautiful nice rind, we, we do use uh, um, co cheese coating, which is applied with a machine. And in the past, we did all this by hand and with the little paint rollers, which was uh, mm -hmm. extremely uh, we've lengthy. automated quite a bit yes yes and then this is um, this is our um, newest one of the newest workers in the creamery um, it's uh, we call it Tina Turner it's a robot which we purchased mm -hmm. in um, 2018 19 I believe mm -hmm. um, and we've had it a little over a year right now and it turned almost uh, 1 million wheels of cheese so um, it really helped us um, making sure that the, the cheese is actually consistent and cared for. It's important to make sure that the cheese is turned on a regular basis. Otherwise, it will stick to the board. The, the damage on the rind from sitting too long in one spot or um, um, causing that the rind might be um, damaged or misshapen or whatnot. So, um, so by having this robot, it really helped us to um, really have a high quality rind. Yeah, one more thing. You can see the brushes that are brushing it and making sure we used to have um, our employees would be brushing it, turning it um, three times a week. Mm -hmm. And so this is really saved. Tina's, Tina's doing a great job. She even works overtime. Another thing, well, we'll talk about it afterwards. I want to talk about airflow and humidity mm -hmm. and just the off and wash stage when we're done with yeah, the video. So, so then this is the final step of cutting wedges. So our machine cuts um, 24 wedges at the time. They're all uh, exact size cuts. They're not necessarily exact weights. So we, uh, in the packaging process, we pre-weigh the wheels to make sure that every, every single piece which is going out of the market is six ounces or more. So, um, yeah, but you used to also, all the cutting was done by hand with the yes. wire cutters. And so we've, we have increased our efficiencies quite a mm -hmm. bit since 2009 I've been here. Great, yeah. So, um, and talk a little bit about just aging because it is the same for all these and then we'll get into the flavors and what inspired us. So, so, so the quickly about the aging and it's, it's actually, I'm going to kind of touch base on two points of, on a Bay Blue and, um, and Toma mm -hmm. is that, um, so we have purchased in two, two years ago, we've purchased, um, systems, um, air quality, uh, system from France, um, which is very sophisticated, uh, equipment which handles uh, the air in an in a aging environment. So it controls the humidity um, as well as temperature and the amount of airflow going through the cheese. So it is very important to make sure that your parameters in the aging room are consistent because as we had in the past, in the, all the aging rooms which were not as sophisticated, we would have variances that there would be certain places of the aging room where the would be higher humidity, we would have more damage on the rinds, 
and then the other room, side of the room would be drier and then the cheese would be drier, not as creamy, but less damages on the right. So, so having this consistent airflow is super, super important. So um, mm -hmm. makes it makes it work. We, we, the one thing we don't have to worry about is that we always know that the, the quality of the room, it's consistent across the board. It doesn't matter how high it is, how low it is, it's always constant. So it's, um, and because we have a monitoring, Pro program where we actually get emails from the system telling us, hey, you have you're outside of your humidity uh, set point. You know we can go and adjust anytime. So that's that's really uh, it's important as well in the quality. Yeah, and from day one, I think what has has always been our intent is um, first of all, it's great quality milk, and it is about you know those flavors coming through in our cheese. So it is about being farmstead and our sense of place in West Marin. And once again, that consistency in that, that whole milk that we use in all of our recipes. But then it's also about consistency. And the consistency is, you know, all of these automations that we've invested in has allowed us to have that consistent um, cheese that you can, your, our customers, your customers, are going to know that flavor of Toma. They're going to know that flavor of Original Blue and Bay Blue, and that they're going to always get that same um, flavor profile. And, um, you know, we really don't, luckily, because they're all aged cheeses as well, they're very sturdy in transportation, so we don't have a lot of issues. Not to say that you might not get a cheese that has a cheese trier in it that we have to replace. Yeah, but but I, for the most part, as artisan cheesemakers, we're constantly looking at continual improvement and with these um, systems. Yeah, and I think, you know, Toma might be a little um, um, more stable cheese as far as the having this similar quality, mm -hmm. but blues, it's, it could be a different story there. They can be a little bit more fragile. Um, but yet still, you know, we, we've, we've done enough research, enough studies to really make sure that the product coming to you guys is mm -hmm. at top quality, what we want to see. And, you know, that, that's, I, I think that's what brings a lot of customer back to purchase our cheeses, for instance, yeah. as any other companies who are having consistent product across the board because they know that every time they're buying it, they know what they can expect. What they're going to get, yeah. So, Toma, the big question is, everybody says, well, first of all, what is Toma? And now we know that it's a, uh, a table cheese, an everyday cheese. Um, it's got great melting um, properties, too, and just snacking. But it's also, where do you place it in the retail store? Where do I find it? Because it's not, you know, a known um, varietal, so to speak. So, because it's, we make it in a Dutch style, so it's similar processes in the make as a, a Gouda or a Havarti, that's where it's going to go. It's not a cheddar. It's, um, it doesn't go into an Alpine style or, a, you know, like a Swiss style. It's not that type of cheese. It doesn't have the big eyes. It's, there are no eyes in here. There's some, there's, there's small, there's tiny, small, tiny, tiny. There's small eyes like a, throughout the haze you might see a little bit of um, ice and this actually the reason behind it is because one of the cultures is um, produces diacetyl which is responsible for that buttery flavors too so and mm -hmm. byproduct of that is a little bit of a co2 which you will see every once in a while to the face but for the most part i would say put yes. it with either you've got an american category mm -hmm. Um, if you happen to be local, local is, you know, however you define it, yeah. but it, it does kind of lend more towards a cross between like a, um, like a young Gouda. Um, so it's, um, I want to ask Connie and Leaf, why don't you give us your opinions on how you like to use it, application, pairings. Leaf, we'll start with East Coast first. Sure. So for the Toma, you know, uh, for me, there's a particular rosemary ham. I think it's Fermani. They have it at every Whole Foods. Uh, that as a melt or a sandwich or a panini is like the perfect way to have it, in my opinion. Um, also, we make a pimento cheese at um, Point Reyes just for the farmer's market and for some local sales. So I always use our Toma to try to duplicate our fork chef, Jen Luttrell, um, her recipe uh, with the Toma at home. So that's one of my favorite things to do with it. I also like, I don't know if this is a leaf thing only, um, toast, sauerkraut, and Toma melted as well. So. I like the avocado toast with it. It's kind of a spin on that, but I like the sauerkraut. Okay, Connie. I would say it's my go-to sandwich cheese, Rubens, paninis. My favorite is grilled cheese. Um, so, and 
the avocado toast is kind of is my main favorite. I actually had that this morning. So that's really kind of my go-to when it comes to Toma. But Toma for me is every day, all day long, snacking, but it is my sandwich cheese. Sure. We've done, yeah, we've done a lot of beer pairings on panels, and it always seems to be the one that goes with all different styles of beers. Yeah. So a lot of coffee, coffee beer. Um, we have so much, so many great breweries in Portland. So yeah, giant beer with their nice hoppy is excellent. Yeah. I would say skip the mozzarella and use Toma on a pizza any day. Yeah. Oh yeah much better flavor it's mm -hmm. it's it's very meltable so it's um yeah I, i've stopped using mozzarella yeah. on a homemade pizza i, I started with a long you. time ago yeah eggs eggs i love the eggs scrambled eggs just grated into that so um let's show well let's first mention no so we've got you've got three flavors in front of you some of you may carry them now and that's fantastic um we got really excited. What inspired us to do flavors, Cuba? What inspired us to make flavors is Lynn Jacobin's flavor. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, I always wanted to have a talk show. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, the inspiration was, I think, that um, a few years ago, I think, Lynn came back saying, we have a customer, they want us to do something special for September. We're talking about and she it was talked, cheese nut. They wanted and, it. And, yeah. and Lynn's talking to me about it in June. So it's like three months away. I'm like, well, mm. you know, you cannot, you know, I cannot do miracles here. So I said, the only one thing we can do is we can do flavors. I said, we have a good base, um, which, um, which is, you know, um, we know, we know what's the characteristic of the cheese will be. We know what they can do when you start cooking with it. Now it's just, let's add some flavors to it without overpowering um the base of the cheese so our goal was really i said i don't want to lose the toma flavor because it's so buttery up front and it's a it's an excellent cheese so how do we just have those spices and herbs kind of be a finish to it and make it you know elevate it to the next level and you know so 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 back then we we started with i don't know we had probably 20 different mm -hmm. things we blended in and we really settled on three um, well, two, and then the third we knew that we wanted to make because yeah. we want to make truffles. So, so truffle was kind of given. Uh, but then Toma, uh, the Toma Provence with Herbe de Provence, um, I personally, uh, it's one of my favorite Start herbs. Start eating it if you don't already. Um, Grab it. And um, so I always, I always like uh, Herbe de Provence, so I always knew that that would actually be a very good pairing with those buttery flavors. And like Lena always says that this is like, when you smell it, when you cook with it, it's like like Thanksgiving. Yeah, it, this is like a comfort cheese. I, it's comfort food to me. You smell it and it smells like roasted chicken, roasted potatoes, which once again, is going to go great on that turkey sandwich at Thanksgiving or any time, time of year, melted into a baked potato or roasted potatoes. Um, I love it with just an olive board and baguette. I mean, it's just like, it's phenomenal. Um, and because it's got these great herbs in there, it is an herb de Provence minus the lavender, so it's not overpowering. Um, you can add it to a, a like a butternut squash galette. You don't have to add all these other herbs. It really comes through. Yeah, this is definitely, well, they're all my favorite, but um, I do love this one. Um, why don't we talk about how do you add herbs? Because people always wonder that in the make process. Annie, you want to show that while everybody's snacking on Toma Provence? So, so the herbs are, because they are dry, we steep them in hot water first. And then um, towards the end of the process, after uh, we finish washing the curd, um, just because we haven't mentioned that Toma is a washed curd cheese, which means that some of the lactose gets washed out, uh, washed out with, um, washed with water. Um, and so then after that, we will add the herbs. You can see that they're not dumped all in one spot um, in a big globe. They're kind of adding it as they go just to make the most uniform um, blend. But uh, yeah, we used to, when we started in this process, this was done in the pre-press table. So it was done by hand. Uh, and then we, we quickly learned that that was way too much work. Um, so, yeah, and then, so adding the herbs, like within pretty much five minutes, um, the herbs are pretty nicely mixed up and then we'll transfer to pre-press table and uh, cut into blocks. 
Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the whole process. And you do this with our um, other two flavors as well yeah. in the same manner. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that, um, because once again, this is an open vat, um, it is done by hand. And when it goes into the pre-pressed tables, sometimes that way as it's drying might actually draw yeah. the herbs. Can you so, explain so, that? What so that, what happens they is, know, you know, um, the, the herbs tend to have the tendency, especially on a, on a tomarashi, um, they will start falling down to the bottom. So then the cheesemakers constantly has to mix that curd before they put, put the uh, pre-pressing plates. Um, if they don't do that, we've had it happen where mm -hmm. a lot of herbs would settle down on the bottom and then all of a sudden you have this thick layer of herbs sitting on one side of the rind, which um, could cause some defects. So anyway, we, sh we have not had that you know, in a long, long time because yeah. we, we learn somewhat a hard way that you know that's we need to keep mixing it so so um, they might get a wheel yeah. that looks like it's heavily weighted like the herbs washed to one side um and some you might get um different uh strengths of the mm -hmm. herb or the spice but that's all part of being an yeah. artisan open that when i talk about artisan it's hand done it's yeah. open vats you've got employees you don't have a computer that is injecting this certain amount so um, yeah, so doing that. yeah, like like you said, there's going to be definitely some variabilities with the, the way how yeah. things are mixed and whatnot. Right, right. So, um, Connie and Leaf, do you have any comments on the Herbs de Provence? Or Mallory, have you tried it? That's where Mallory's at. Yes, I have. It's delicious. Um, I My favorite is the Tomarashi, I think, so, and I know you're getting to that. Um, but yeah, all the Tomas are really great. And it's a good snacking cheese, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. Connie or Leaf, do you have a comment on the Toma Rashi, I mean, Toma Provence, before we move on? Yes. Uh, so a couple things I like to do in the summer uh, with a fresh tomato pie. Uh, so you have like caramel onions, fresh tomatoes, and Toma, Toma Provence is really amazing. Um, and then grilling vegetables on focaccia and then grating Toma on it. Uh, Toma Provence. Also, just have it on hand for the day after Thanksgiving for your leftover sandwich or your turkey croquettes. Uh, amazing little treat for that. Leave you snake in the grass, you are. I didn't know that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, actually, we have added a, a little bit to our mashed potatoes, and it's delicious. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, next up is Mallory's favorite. We're gonna do, we're gonna save the truffle for last. Is that what you said? That's, that, either way, I mean, there's, it, it depends. Everybody has different preferences. Like my preference is to have truffles at the end because I find truffles the strongest. Um, there is, however, the aspect of spiciness in a, in a tomarashi, which one might find it that, you know, because the spice can, you know, kind of, um, not ruin your palate, but overpower it. Where, but I find that tomarashi has um, so we're gonna eat the tomarashi. very subtle um, <laughs> spice and heat level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that the truffles can certainly um, the weight uh, carry yeah. the weight of it. Okay, so tomarashi is up next, and you know um, when we were deciding on what three flavors we wanted to um, introduce and launch in the marketplace which by the way, it was only last year. So if you don't have it, you're not behind. There's plenty of it that we're making now. And it's just really, um, I think, starting to explode with retailers and customers who are getting more familiar with it and asking for it. But this was a really fun one. We, we looked at trends and what's happening. And you know, the older we get, we start to lose our taste buds. Um, one of the downsizes, I guess. But it's also a good thing because there's all these great, you know, um, products out there that have heat or umami flavors and savory. And I mean, Asian flavors are really popular. And so we are, uh, we started looking at, you know, what, what will work and what's different. And we love the whole idea of, you know, we went to France for Toma Provence. We went to, of course, Italy for their truffle. And then the Rashi was our Japanese inspiration 
which um, you want to talk about that spice blend that you and our executive chef, Jennifer, picked out. Yep. So, um, so this is, um, has, um, I believe, seven different spices in it. It's, mm -hmm. it's got sesame seeds. It's got the uh, different chilies. The, one of them is the, I always forget what was the togarashi. Yeah, so chichimi is, yes, is the Japanese seven spice blend, chichimi. There's, uh, and there's some nori, um, there's... Uh, ses sesame seeds, so you get like a toasted sesame up front, hemp seed, black hemp seed, seed, ginger, nori, so you get the umami flavors, and then it goes into the Japanese togarashi mm -hmm. chili at the end. Yes, which um, which is not, like I said, and that, the trick is too that we, we want to have a little bit something spicy, but we don't want to just dump a bunch of uh, chili flakes where it's like, you know, completely overpowers the cheese and you don't really taste anything else. And I think with the tomarashi, what it really works well is like you, I do enjoy the sesame up front with a little bit of a nori in it. And then once you finish eating the, the cheese, you kind of like waiting for a heat and then like a few, few seconds later, just kicks in this gentle little heat, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty pleasant. It's not, not something you have to chase down with a bucket of water on it. Not so you still get that buttery even yeah. with with the complexity of the spice and that nice long finish you still taste the toma up front that's it with all of these and one of the things that we definitely wanted to bring across in our flavored line was that we're not masking a mediocre cheese with flavors we really wanted that to be a really nice complement and you could still identify the toma and we want toma to be an everyday name a household name so where people will eventually be asking for Thomas. Um, so I know Leif, you have a lot of ways you like to use Tomarashi. Uh, one in particular and it's when I was grilling corn over the summer so you know you make like a street style corn but you use uh, instead of a Mexican cheese the Tomarashi. Tex-Mex is, a, this is a great cheese in enchilada quesadillas, real quick, easy, and it gives you enough of that heat. Um, and then as far as um, merchandising, something completely different, which I love is, and I think somebody might have said it in the, um, the chat here, are those nori, those nori strips. So those seaweed strips that you can get, I know you all have them in your stores now because they're really hot, but use that as a vehicle as a um, instead of a cracker and then it becomes a gluten-free appetizer but it's so damn good i swear i love that noise with it it's so savory umami and it's great with a gin and tonic or um sake so mm -hmm. you got to get your drinks in there too yeah we like our gin yeah um so what else uh, also in um a lot of italian dishes i mean i don't know everything with the tom uh, the tomarashi it's great I think toma altogether is just easy, easy cheese, easy cheese to mm -hmm. really incorporate yeah. in, in cooking. Okay, let's get on to the last one, which is oh, that's another one of my favorites. So this one was oh, tricky. This one was tricky so too because we, um, uh, I find that with with the truffles, it's like you really have to be careful on not to overpower the flavors. It's because, one of the hardest cheeses yes, to make. Yes, it's uh, it's certainly like trying to find the right balance of how many how much truffle ratio to the curd you need to add to still hold the butter, buttery flavors of Toma and getting, you know, plenty of truffle flavor as well. It's, um, I think it was pretty challenging and, you know, it's one thing when we've done initial trials on the 10 pounds of curd mm -hmm. and then you're scaling up to thousand pounds of curd, you know, yeah. so that was, you know, certainly, certainly there was some, a lot of refinements needed. Well, and everybody to likes truffle at different levels. Mm -hmm. One thing we all agreed on though was we wanted a true essence of that truffle flavor. So it's it's earthy and sweet, it's mushroomy, and it's elegant with the toma, with that butteriness up front, and then you've got this nice subtle finish. So it's not overpowering. It's not like you're, you know, a, a truffle oil. This is a pate that we partnered with um, Sabatino in Italy. So they, um, we work with their R&D person that makes truffle pate that we put into the vat, like you saw the Toma Provence, uh, the herbs going in. We do the same thing with the pate and it mixes with it. And it's just a really, it's a perfect balance with yeah. this cheese. 
I love grating this in my eggs in the morning and then drizzling it with balsamic. If that could be more a dinner or, or breakfast. So, um, shave a little bit on the pasta too, mm -hmm. very thinly. Yeah. Um, really save, nice. save you on buying truffles. Yeah. Yeah. We did it for you. So Mallory, before we move on to our next thing, do you have a, um, one of a favorite Toma here? Yes, so my favorite um, is the tomarashi, and I grew up um, grating, this sounds bizarre, but I would put cheddar cheese in my ramen, and I would mix that up. Um, it sounds gross, but it's really delicious, and so when that came out, I snack alongside ramen, and it, the flavor combo is such a good complement. Um, it has those umami flavors, and um, so that's a good thing, and then the... Um, the nori sheets. We actually last year for our great 28 issue, all the staff made pairing suggestions and that was my pairing suggestion was the nori sheets with the tomarashi as a good little snack. So. Great. And we've done, our marketing team does a great job. As you can see on my t-shirt, we've um, identified this in a playful way of calling it Tomo with the attitude so that each flavor has a different personality and we've got fun buttons and things like that. But um, it really does tell you when, if you've got all three in your case, you know, what type of personality and such that you're going to get from the different selections of the varieties. But, you know, I want to move, now that we've eaten a lot of cheese, we're going to take a little bit of a palate break before we dive into Bay Blue and show you a little bit about what's been going on in the farm. And our newest um, investment, we do a lot with sustainability, as I had mentioned earlier. Um, and right now, um, with uh, this year in particular, we've been through years of drought, but this year it's been even worse, especially with all the fires out in the West. And our hearts go out to a lot of our friends and winery partners, and it's it's not an easy time for anybody. And um, this year has been a tough one, so we're going to be there for you guys. We um, for all those people who are doing food service as well. If there's anybody on this, we definitely are. You know, you're in our hearts and minds, and. Our cows are still milky and we're still putting milk in the vats um, and we're gonna be there for you when we get through this and we will get through it. But water is an issue for us. So we have a lot of water reclamation programs that's been, um, that is at the top of our priority list um, in the last month or so since the fires happened. So more to come on that, but we do have a lot of programs to where we're, um, we're really looking at saving on our water consumption more and more every year. One of the, but the one big thing that we were really excited about this last year that kind of happened at the right before COVID was phase one and then in um, March we had phase two was to give some attention and some investment into our dairy program and our cows. So we want to share with you our exciting new installment of our robotic milker, milkers, milking machines. Annie, you want to cue that up? So as you can see, we have Holsteins. Those are traditional dairy cows. Um, they're grazing off the property. So they're out there about, oh, about six, eight months out of the year. There's my dad. And that's just an old picture to show you. They used to go around that field behind there with a stool and a bucket and literally be milking the cows. And this was, you know, uh, two generations ago. But then we moved on to a milking parlor like this one, which would milk 15 cows at one time. There's a milk meter that's measuring how much milk is coming out of the cow. Um, what you're seeing here is feed that we feed the cows. So they only get to graze off the property because we only have grass about six months out of the year. So we give them a, um, a combination of other byproducts here. And um, one of the fun tools that we got with our robotic milking machine is what we call a Juno. She's a pusher that helps feed the cows. Oh, she's, oh, she wasn't on this video. Sorry about that. That was another little robot. But nutrition is very important. And when, um, this is Laylee. Laylee is our robotic milking um, machine that comes from the Netherlands. And basically what's happening here is, as you can see, there's an arm that's the robot going out underneath the cow that is, well, cleaning the teeth right now, doing a, a pre-clean. Um, before the um, 
the pumps will go ahead and you can see there's lasers that are going to map out and identify that particular cow's positioning of each of its quarters and its teats and it's going to grab on. Whereas we used to have a milker actually doing this. So we used to milk twice a day every 12 hours. What the huge benefit of a robotic milking machine is that the cows can have a voluntary opportunity to come in and get milked pretty much when they want. We do separate it to so where they can't go in less than eight hours so that their milk volume has been established and they have enough to be milked. Um, but one of the big things is, is it's all about cow comfort. They're not stand, they're not waiting 12 hours. They come in about every eight hours. So they're averaging about three milkings a day, which gives us between 10 to 15% more milk without where there's no hormones, the cows are treated, you know, really great. And it just gives them an opportunity to decide when they want to get milked. This is our milking, um, our computer from our uh, Lely machine. So what you're seeing here is everything from really all about that particular cow. So each cow has a cow collar, kind of like a Fitbit that will regulate um, her temperature, how long she might be laying down for her rumination so that we can really monitor everything about that cow, make sure that she's healthy. And if she ends up being in heat, we can monitor that. Or if she's not feeling well, we can separate her out. This screen here is showing some of the data that we can pull from um, these um, machines. And the first thing is all about their productivity while they're being milked. So the amount of milk that she's producing the time that she is being milked. Um, as you can see each, there's four tubes there and it is for each quarter to see how productive that each quarter, each teat is going to be giving um, milk. Some cows only have three that are um, productive. So we can see that and we can see how much um, they're actually producing. So that 46.1 pounds on the, the main bulk tank down below that each of those, um, those teat lines are coming into. That is giving us what her average has been and should be. And then that 20.7 next to it is as it's filling up, it's showing us where it's at. So it's still filling right now, but we hope to get around 46 pounds. Um, each cow is producing um, about 98 pounds to 100 pounds of milk a day with these milking machines now that they can come in three times a day. Compared to previously twice a day, we were probably averaging about 83, 84 pounds. So we're seeing significant difference and we're just monitoring their wellness and their health so much more. Um, here you're seeing the discharge of the, um, of the machine and it's giving it a post dip as well. The cow is enticed to come in. She is because there's food there. So they're getting about 10 pounds a day of food in that machine. Once again, cow comfort is huge. And so we've got some massagers around um, the barn so that they can um, get comfortable. There we got a little head massage. So that's a fun thing that they absolutely love. But you walk into our barns and there's, every cow is just so quiet they're happy. That makes a huge difference in their comfort level of how, when they're, first of all, eating, they're eating healthy, and then they're letting down their milk in, in non-stressed environments. Our cows are still, as you saw, um, out in the field grazing for part of the year. About 30% of their diet comes from our grass, whether they're grazing or it's in our total mixed ration. So we'll preserve the, uh, the grass in the spring so it's part of their diet as silage. Um, nutrition could be a class all on its own. And we have a nutritionist that comes. He's part of our executive team. Um, so maybe we'll have him on next time. Yeah. Yep. So that's what's new on the farm with the milky machines. But let's get to um, Bay Blue. Unless Mallory, do you have any questions or anything's coming from? Um, uh, yeah, one quick question that I had about the byproducts. Um, what sort of byproducts do you use for feed? Um, besides the grasses. Sure, I know that went kind of fast because like I said, that could be a class in itself, but when she was holding that there, 
We look at the diet as a whole and we, we're looking at different components such as, you know, fat, some omega-3s, um, protein, um, and carbohydrates. So we have everything from, you saw rolled corn in there. We have almond holes. Um, and that is from 80% of all the almonds in the world are grown in Northern California. So that's a local access for us that provides roughage um, as well as it provides um, protein. Um, we have cottonseed that gives us some omega-3 and it's the seed um, that's left over that cottonseed from when we're making um, jeans and other um, cotton products. Um, but that's got um, a lot of um, nutritional value as well. We also have um, brewer's, brewer's grain. Oh, our brewer's grain. So we've got Lagunitas Brewing Company close by. So we use their byproduct as we, well. We have uh, our own whey, which we um, feed back to the cows, which From is high source of sugar. Mm -hmm. That lactose that's coming out of the byproduct. And that's about 70%. You saw that liquid after we separated the curds in the whey. 70% of um, what we start with with cheese making ends up becoming um, whey. That if you are not on a farm, you actually have to haul that away. But we reuse it because it's a great nutritional and it's sweet for the cows. We add it to their feed. That replaces about two, two pounds of corn per cow per day. Yeah, so, and then the remainder of that way goes to the digester, so it helps us yeah. create more uh, methane and therefore more electricity. Yeah, so I'll just make a highlight on that. We have a methane digester that supplies about 60% of our energy needs on the farm. So that's with all the waste, um, wastewater that we're collecting in the barns. So lots of things, lots of things happening on the farm. This is why we love to have people out and really educate them about um, how we are, you know, as sustainable as possible. So whereas most farms are because you don't have resources nearby. Okay. So you guys ready for Bay Blue? So, okay, real quick, when Cuba came, the first thing we said was, you got to get, you know, really hone in on original blue, make it consistent, then make a cheese that's not blue for all of our non-blue lovers. And then we immediately said, oh, and by the way, make a another blue that is completely different than original blue. Um, and so you create a Bay Blue. Yeah. So, um, so when, when we decided that we want to make another blue, we, um, I right away decided that, okay, I need to make this blue significantly easier than what's original blue is because the original blue process is such a complex process it it, it requires separation of the milk for the skim milk and the cream homogenization whatnot it's a very lengthy process i said you know this is how hard can we to make it a little bit simpler and you know we knew right away too that we we don't want to make another rindless blue because that would basically just um, defeat the purpose of having two rindless blues so we knew that it's gonna have to have a rind um and also we want to make blue which doesn't have to age for super long time so you know so all those things were kind of the priority list and so we started experimenting back in 2011 i think mm -hmm. and um yeah came up with bay blue which is this um very savory um very complex in flavors blue which has enough sweetness depending on depending on the age of it you know it, it can become more sweet uh or it can be more savory if it's a little younger so mm -hmm. it's got a lot of different flavor complexities as well as even when you're tasting it too um you can taste different ages of the cheese depending if you taste close to the rind or like in the middle of the cheese, in the, in the, of the core of your wedge, for instance. So you often will have a little bit more um, younger version per se of Bay Blue closer to the rind than um, towards the center. Yeah, so you said this is a pasteurized one. Yeah, no, I didn't, but you did. Okay, yeah. So everybody always asks, because most, most people have original blue in their um, retail case, and they always say, well, what's the difference? So, yeah, the biggest one is original blues are only raw milk cheese. So this is pasteurized. Um, and uh, it's, I always say that the original blue is the, um, it is the traditional kind of blue that's that sweet milk flavor up front and then it's got this pepper pungency. So it's your classic kind of strong pepper pungency. And the um, bay blue is um, your savory and sweet. So if you're looking for a cheese, coarse cheese and 
you're not sure if you've got guests that really love blue cheese and a strong one, then go for the bay blue because that is definitely, sometimes people say it's a gateway. I think it definitely has a nice um, bite to it though, but because of the sweetness in there and that finish and that savory earthiness that comes from um, the traditional rennet that we use. Did you mention that too? No, I didn't know. Okay. So we use a traditional rennet. <laughs> All of our other cheeses are microbial. This is the one that we use a traditional rennet and we tried it both ways. And there was a lot of um, flavor that came from that rennet yeah. that gave us that mm -hmm. kind of mushroomy, once again, this umami savory flavor, I call it brothy. Um, and it's it's got this kind of like a toasted maltiness. And when I talk about malty, I'm thinking of like a brewer's malted grain um, that is so good. If any of you attended ACS last year, Vanessa, um, she did a tasting with Bay Blue in Sarsaparilla. I mean, you could exchange root beer for it, but it was phenomenal. So there's lots of different ways to utilize Bay Blue, and it's been um, it's been a, it's been a cult favorite for um, gosh, almost nine years now. Well, you've made it. Yeah. Yeah, um, Connie, what's your what's your thoughts on Bay Blue? You have some um, applications you want to share. Well, I have to say Chef Jen really this summer um, introduced me to um, peaches and poached peaches with just a little bit of the blue cheese on it. And of course, it's always my go-to in risotto. I love the Bay Blue in risotto. Um, but it's just one of the cheeses that I throw in my salad and it's just so versatile. And you're right, it's, it is that, that um, I like to say the caramel fudgy uh, flavor, more mild. Mm -hmm. but, um, I'm sure Leaf has some really good recipes. Yeah. Did we show the video? Uh, I don't think so. We didn't show the video, did we, Annie? Mm -hmm. Let's let's show the video really quick because we've got some time, but just kind of how we make Bay Blue. So you'll see um, there is, um, that's what we do first before we start cutting the curtains manually, we inspect the firmness of the gel. Um, to make sure that it's ready to be cut. If it's cut, if you cut too early, you will shatter the curd, and um, a lot of curd will go away with whey. So, so determining the right cutting point is very important. Again, the mechanism of cutting is still the same. It's mostly cut by machine, but there's a significant assistance from the cheesemaker as well as he or she needs to decide how fast this, um, those uh, agitators need to go in order to cut into smaller size curd or keeping a little bigger. So um, there you see the process of hooping. So it's, um, we pump the curd over to the little uh, metal screen which just separates the whey from the curd. And um, we fill those forms all the way to the top. And after that, we stack them inside this uh, flipping station and then all 120 wheels can be turned in one time. We used to do this process by hand, so each individual wheel would be turned and um, it was a very lengthy process. Um, the next day the cheese gets salted, all the blues we salt by hand, original blue and bay. So um, it's a lot of manual labor. Uh, after three days of salting, we uh, do uh, piercing to uh, introduce the oxygen uh, into the wheel, which there uh, will supply the oxygen for the malt to grow and then breaking down the cheese. So the, already, the blue cheeses are the only cheeses really which age from the inside to the outside. Um, and what that means is that, you know, like when you take camembert, for instance, when you cut it when it's young, it's, it's going to have a softer uh, outer layer and then a very dry and chalky uh, middle. With blues, they will actually get softer in the middle, and then they're gonna be drier towards the end, towards the outside. So and you can see, here. you can see right now, like progression of the wheels, how they get covered with uh, exterior mold, and how they create the crust throughout the aging. This is this is um, pictures based basically between week one and five. Um, so you can see that those wheels getting that nice golden uh, color to it. And then um, here you will see, we evaluate every wheel, every batch by cutting the wheels in half to see um, how, the, how the mold is distributed, how, you know, 
is is there a big ring around the um, the perimeter of the wheel and usually that that tells us if there is that the wheels were over salted perhaps so um so there's you know th this this particular cut is being done usually within the first uh three weeks of uh, of, uh, of the aging so we kind of can evaluate um, where the product goes and what we can expect from it. Leif, do you have any comments you want to make on um, on Bay Blue? Sure. Um, we're running out of time a little bit, so I'll keep it brief so we can get a couple Q&As answered. Um, trying to perfect the Bay Blue s'more. So I'm honing in with the Effie's um, Cocoa Cake as my graham cracker. And then, you know, obviously the Bay Blue is the replacement for the marshmallow. And then I haven't found like the right chocolate or caramel balance, um, but fat toad caramel for all you East Coasters, there's a bunch of different ones that go with uh, Bay Blue really well. Oh, that's awesome. And that reminds me of a, uh, a spin on a root beer float. So do vanilla ice cream with a, um, a stout, like a cappuccino stout, and then crumbled Bay Blue on top. It's a nice adult float for you. <laughs> anyway, um, Mallory, do we have some questions? We've got some time here to answer anything. Yeah, so a few of the questions that have been popping up, if you have any wine suggestions for the different cheeses. Mm -hmm. So um, I think for the Tomas in general, um, you know, once again, I. I think it's more of a, a beer cheese um, because it's got so much fat. It's nice to have that carbonation to lift it off. And um, we're talking like a piney style, like IPA, but it can go all the way to a, um, oh, we could have an amber, a red amber, something that's got some like more caramel notes to go with that. What do you think? Yeah, um, hoppy beers are really well, um, goes well with it. Like, um, like an I actually do, enjoy it also with like stouts mm -hmm. um can go well but as far as wines Wine, i think yeah. it's chardonnay every day yeah you're, you're day. chardonnay i'm a, I'm a <laughs> chenin blanc so more of a um a french style a rome so where you've got some nice um so not not oaky chardonnay but yeah. i really like your chardonnays um but pinot noirs go pinot with noirs, it as yeah. well you don't want anything that's going to be too tannic and yeah. it's too overpowering by any means mm -hmm. and then oh cocktails once again when you're talking of like a dutch style cheese and you're trying to pull out those kind of nutty sweet notes anything like a manhattan a bourbon drink something Even like that single mold scotch yep goes well mm -hmm. and then when you're getting into the flavors um i do like yeah a a, a chardonnay that goes with the provence because of the herbs a um on the tomarashi once again the gin and tonic when you get that umami and that heat it's nice to get something that's going to cool it down on the cocktail side of the gin yeah and you know what at the end of the day too it's like you just experiment with what you think you know mm -hmm. might work and just have fun with it yes. and try to come up with your own you know pairing yeah and then on the bay blue wine bay blue wine i would say you know like I can I can see like petite Syrah, something yeah. um, something heavier, darker. Um, obviously, like the sweeter stuff, like port goes well with blues always. Mm -hmm. um, but I would think something more on the berry side, like yeah, um, I agree. Uh, yeah, something more fruit forward, yeah. but with a medium body. So I would even say like you know, there's some great Merlots out there. I think the Pinot is is too light for yeah. um, the Bay Blue. Um, and once again, um, classic cocktails. So adding that kind of pairing with that sweetness in there. Um, and also, how many times does the Toma get flipped before it leaves the farm? Well, it's um, the short answer is so we're aging it for three months. Um, it's going to aging room within the first week from being made. Uh, and it's probably turning, let's assume one twice a week at, two and a half at, at least for two and a half months yeah. so tina's so, busy quite a bit there's a, there is the reason why you know we we have in our aging room we have capacity of seventeen thousand wheels we only have right now i think we're only running at about half the capacity about eight eight to nine thousand so um but again numbers of uh from tina tells you how much work she does because you know she's almost reaching a million turns, 
right now in a, in a year and a half. Right. That's it for now. Hopefully we'll get a few more as we do have a little surprise for everybody because, um, you know, and I'm sorry to see Stephanie's not here. We go way back with Stephanie and Culture Magazine, and we just want to say thank you so much for providing this platform to share our stories. And of course, Stephanie, uh, which most of you I'm sure know, she always likes to add, wants you to add like a personal element and um, wants you to share something that nobody else knows. That the first time you hear it, it's on counterculture. And it just, um, I guess it just brings also a little bit of us to you and vice versa and we can share um, our, our different um, new things that we do outside of cheese. So Kuba and I have something in common. We um, both like to, besides cheese making, like to ferment things. Um, and so he's got something going on in his garage at home and I've got something in my garage and we wanted to share that with you. So this is what we're doing when we're not in the cheese business. So Kuba, you're first, I think. All right, so I make wine at home, and I started making wine in 2014. Um, I made, um, with a couple of my friends, we purchased a ton of grapes and made Syrah. And since then, I've been making wine every year, and um, the number of tons has increased over the years. So at, at one point last year, my wife got very frustrated with me because there was 14 barrels my garage so that's um each barrel is worth about 25 cases of wine so you did them up i had a lot of wine <laughs> yes if you come to the farm you will get some of kuba's wine yes <laughs> and i started in 2016 was my first vintage so i live in the town of point race and we're on a couple acres and we have these walnut trees. And the first couple of years, um, we moved there in 2000 and uh, I would dry the walnuts and then I just didn't have time for it and it would take over our whole garage. So I thought I can't let this go to waste. And so I make Nocino, which is an Italian walnut liqueur. And as you can see there, you pick them in um, the third week in June. It's a particular time of year. You have to get them when they're green and where those husks are soft enough, they feel hard, but you can actually cut into them. You quarter them, as you can see, and it goes into these big jars. And I add um, different spices to it and some citrus and vodka. And I basically ferment it. It goes out in the sun. You can see those big jars on the table down there on the bottom left-hand side of the picture. It sits out in the sun for about 60 days. And then I put it in a dark cooler for a little over a year. And it has a lot of, um, it's got cloves and cinnamon and star anise and um, some black peppercorns and even some coffee beans in there, um, along with some citrus rinds. And so it's just this wonderful kind of wintertime holiday drink that becomes very dark. And I use it, you can either have it over ice as a, an aperitif or you can add it um, as an extra to like a Manhattan or a martini to give it a little nuttiness. Um, but I also like it in the summertime with Campari and soda. So it's, um, it's a really fun drink to have and share with friends. So we're always trying to see, you know, what we can do with all the riches of uh, California's bounty. So we actually have an Annie. Do you have that up right now? We have everybody's name who's on here and we're going to pick a name. And um, the winner is going to, I hope everybody's name's on here, we're, is going to get a bottle of each of our products. You get a bottle, what, what was this? Is this your Petit Syrah or? No, this is the is red blend. Oh, it's a blend. He's got a few different ones and my Nochino. So since you can't come here, we're gonna bring our uh, wares to you. Who do we get? Katie Curry. Yay! <laughs> Katie, where, where's Katie from? Anybody know? I hope you like liquor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where Katie's from. But Katie, reach out to us or we will reach out to you because I think we have your um, contact information. We'll have to get your address and we're going to send you a bottle of each and you'll have to let us know what you do with it and how you like it. So, all right. That was awesome. Um, 
I did not know that you guys had those side projects. That's really fun. Um, for everyone else joining, um, if you have any straggler questions at all, feel free to reach out. Let us know how you felt this went. Um, any commentary is great. And thank you guys so much. Um, this was really wonderful. So I'll let you guys um, wrap up and, and say a final thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, so it was it was great uh, participating in this uh, Zoom, um, what would you call webinar, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I only, you know, it's uh, it's been six months in making of us being more and more um, present at those Zoom webinars. And it's, uh, it's super fun to interact with people who, you know, are selling our cheese and being the face of, of the cheese out there in the marketplace and really promoting our brand and, um, you know, it means a lot to us, uh, especially in those times right now during COVID where, you know, we cannot see you guys here at the ranch, but like Lynn said, um, mm -hmm. you guys always more than welcome to come and visit us whenever COVID is over and we get it under control. We would love to see you guys here. Right. So, yeah. And just to echo that, thank you so much. And we really look at, um, you know, cheesemongers um, in particular and all those that support us. Um, and if you're with a restaurant as well that you know you really recognize the farmers and what we do and you're our heroes you're the ones telling the stories because we can't you're the ones that your customers rely on to say t you know try this cheese we recognize that you can't sample cheese today which is a huge challenge so it's um, these stories that you can share with them about our practices what we do and how much it means to us so thank you thank you and thank you we couldn't do it without you Thanks, culture. Yeah, thank you.